Guys, we are on. We are ready to go. How's build going so far? Woo! Yeah! All right. More free stuff. Now, if you guys, you guys come in to build, uh, you, you're here for announcements, right? You know, you want big reveals, and that's what I'm here to give you today. I've actually got a big reveal that I want to share with you. Uh, my name's Dave Cliff. I'm a program manager on the workflow team here at Microsoft. And I'm excited to be here so that I can reveal this big announcement. So let's go right into it. I am announcing my candidacy for US president. Here we go. Enter the ring. I'm, I'm throwing my hat into it. My, uh, I, I'm really excited here because, uh, what's that? You can't. I can't. No, I know. That's right. Uh, as Andreas knows, I'm actually a Canadian citizen, so uh, I can't actually run for president. But ignoring that fact, and for all the, those of you who maybe aren't from the US, it is election season around here uh, in the US. Uh, there's a lot of really kind of funny uh, political announcements and that kind of stuff going on. Um, if, you, if you like freedom, if you like life, then it's really important that you vote for Dave Cliff, all right? Because, you know, the other guys obviously clearly believe in slavery and death, right? And that's, that's why you'd come and vote for me. Um, this, is, this is my daughter actually here. I'm, I'm good at kissing babies now. I had to practice that, obviously. I need to practice that for the campaign trail. Um, this session is really, it's all about workflow, but the fact is that there are a number of really interesting workflow processes involved in kind of the election process, uh, the campaigning process, and all of that. And so I thought it'd be a funny way to kind of illustrate some of my points as we go through. So I'm going to take you through my candidacy and exactly what, we're, what, uh, what I'm, what I'm uh, sharing as part of, part of this workflow session today. <laughs> I know, she seems really upset. <laughs> Need to, I need to practice that. This is paid for by the Friends of Dave Cliff, by the way. Um, I love these paid political announcements that say that just because, um, you know, I mean, really, I'd rather, honestly, if you just bought me a beer instead of doing this. I don't know. Don't, don't buy me a political announcement. Anyway, let's, let's get into it. We've we got a lot of great, great content today. We're going to talk about workflow in .NET 4.5. So hopefully some of you have already played with some of that, um, but I'm going to kind of breeze through a number of the great features that, uh, that we've added in Workflow Foundation in .NET 4.5. And then we're going to talk about this new thing called Workflow Manager 1.0 and how it's integrated into the SharePoint 2013 ecosystem. And for you as developers, uh, I really think that'll, that that'll be a really interesting piece because you can maybe start to leverage the workflow ecosystem, all that workflow knowledge that you already have in a SharePoint context. Uh, and so that's really cool. We'll talk about the roadmap. Um, but before we do all that, I want to step up and I want to talk about what I call the art of workflow. And this will really be applicable regardless of if you've you know, really never used workflow, you're just trying to get a sense of it, or even if you're a, a seasoned workflow veteran uh, and you've used a lot of it before, I really hope you'll get a lot out of this piece. So let's jump in. What is the art of workflow? Well, a workflow in and of itself is really just a program. In fact, it is a declarative program. Um, and what we mean by that is that you have a nice clear view, a nice uh, data-driven view of your process. And this program, um, in many ways, can represent a long-running business process. It can represent a long-running kind of system process that's going. It can represent human interactions with a, with, uh, with a workflow. And all of these things uh, are really kind of wrapped up into what we call workflow. And what we've delivered is effectively a set of activities, a, a runtime for, for those workflows to run on, and a set of tooling on top of that. And so what you've, what you've got is really ART. You've got art. You've got the, the, work, the art of workflow. And these pieces I want to drill into. So in terms of activities, what we provide out of the box in Workflow Foundation is a set of activities that you can use, primarily around control flow. And what you can do with these, with these activities is you can go off as a developer and you can go build a workflow if you choose to. Uh, the, the thing that we're hearing more and more from customers and, and this kind of common scenario usage for workflow is really that in some cases, you as a developer, you're not actually the one building the workflow. In fact, what you're building is a platform that you can provide to your users for them to build workflows. So you're kind of leveraging the extensibility of workflow as a, as a framework and up-leveling that to your users such that they can write the workflows in terms of activities that you've designed, that you've supplemented in the activity library. And that nice domain-specific language that you've given them, they can go organize their workflows in terms of that. And so 
those two scenarios, kind of you as the developer writing the workflow, you providing a, a platform for those to, uh, to build workflows, are really kind of two core scenarios uh, to what workflow provides. And we're really interested in both of them. So once you've got a workflow, you really need a way of taking that workflow and running it in some way. And so what we've provided is, that, is a runtime that you can go do that with. And the runtime is kind of broken up into a couple of pieces. And, and some of you who have used Workflow before, you may not know um, exactly these, uh, these set, set of pieces. But effectively, what we've got in there is an activity programming model. So we've got the, the, uh, the programming model that you'll use to build your workflow, to build activities. That's part of the core runtime. Then below that is the actual core runtime that will run your workflow. And this thing is actually called Workflow Instance in the .NET framework. So we've got this class called Workflow Instance. It's really where the core logic is for executing a workflow. And what we've done is basically wrap those two pieces together into a number of different host solutions. Uh, things like Workflow Invoker, Workflow Application, and Workflow Service Host. And each of these workflow hosts effectively uh, raise different capabilities to the user depending on the types of host services that they provide. And these host services are things like core persistence, obviously important for long-running workflows, tracking, the ability to kind of see where your process is at in its execution, uh, durable timers, the ability to pause your, your execution process and wake it up maybe after 24 hours, 48 hours later, and any number of other additional host services. In the case of workflow service host, think the ability to receive WCF messages. This is just another host service. And these are all part of the, the kind of runtime aspect of running a workflow. Now the next piece is, is you need to wrap that up into a process in some way. So whether you're going to integrate it with an XE that you already own, that you're already developing and run workflows in that, or you're going to host them in IIS, use message activation, um, that's up to, entirely up to you. Totally make, make your own choice as to what's appropriate in your scenario. So once you've got that, that together, um, really, that's, those, are, those are kind of the pieces that you need in order to build and run a workflow. But the third thing that we provide is a set of tooling. So we provide you a Visual Studio-based experience to build workflows. We provide you the, uh, the ability to take that Visual Studio experience and actually re-host it within your own application, if you so choose. So a good concrete example of this would be like Dynamics Exapta. If you've used Exapta before, you've seen the workflow experience is a flowchart. It happens to be our flowchart designer. And then you can go arrange your workflow in terms of the activities that are provided to a Dynamics Exapta user, like a task, uh, and, and doing, doing those sorts of things on, on Exapta entities. Uh, the third, third kind that is absolutely in play as well is go build your own custom designer. If you don't like what we've provided, Go build your own. All you have to be able to do is serialize whatever you get from the user into a set of uh, into a XAML document or, or a set of activities. Throw that into the runtime. You're good to go. So this is the art of workflow: activities, runtime, tooling. And what you'll see is that we've we've provided this in .NET 4. We've continued to improve upon this in .NET 4.5, and we've continued to supplement this even in Workflow Manager. All right, let's take a look at .NET 4.5 investments in workflow. So at a high level, we've got kind of three bucket areas. We've got authoring improvements. And there's a number of huge authoring improvements here that we really want to really call out. C-sharp expressions. How many people have written C-sharp workflows that had to use VB expressions in them? Yeah, you got C-sharp expressions now. .NET 4.5, book it. All right. We've made a number of enhancements in the designer to make you more productive as a user. So a number of couple of snap-ins that I'll show. Uh, really, really useful functionality uh, that will hopefully make you more productive with our, de with our designer today. We support State Machine out of the box, .NET 4.5. That's a huge win as well, making sure that it's there, installed. You don't have to go get, you know, install some, some separate kind of platform update in order to get it in there. And then finally, contract-first authoring of workflow services. This was a huge feedback point for, for those of you who are building workflow services today. I want to be able to take a contract that's maybe been defined by my architecture team, or maybe it's you know, just a principle that I follow. I, I build my contracts first. Then I want to go build a workflow that implements that. Those are all great new authoring improvements built to make you more productive. 
The next area is around versioning. And this, what, again, was one of the biggest pain points that we heard from .NET 4 users of workflow, is I've got long-running business processes. I need to be able to version those. And so what we've done is not just build the basic building blocks uh, of, for a versioning story, but we've also provided some implementations of a couple of core solutions, like side-by-side -side versioning and dynamic update. And we'll go into what those specifically mean in just a second. And then finally, we've continued to, to pound on the runtime and make sure that the runtime uh, really has, you know, performs well, that it's, it supports some things like partial trust, and that you have come some additional extensibility there as well. So really, this is the swath of improvements that we've made in .NET 4.5 and workflow. And as you can see, there's improvements across activities, runtime, and tooling. So we've got activities like state machine. We've got runtime enhancements like performance enhancements, uh, enhancements around uh, workflow identity and putting that into the core uh, to give you a versioning story, and enhancements around tooling to make you more productive. This is a hugely important release to us. This was, this was really just as a complete result of customer feedback, .NET 4, um, and we really tried to prioritize what, what were the, the top asks from customers. And we think we really hit kind of the, the, the top five, if not even the top 10 in this release. So we're really excited about that. Let's jump into what some of those look like. All right, so here we go. I'm over in Visual Studio 2012. I'm, I'm looking at a flow chart here. And this is really kind of just a, a basic kind of approval process. It's not particularly large, but, but the nice thing is I do have some, some enhancements that allow me to, to kind of navigate this a little bit better. So I can kind of search for something like maybe CEO. Maybe I'm, I'm interested in, uh, in where my CEO has to get involved in this process. So I can kind of jump through, and this will jump me into the individual activities, point them out, and this is, a, this is great. This is just kind of basic uh, search enhancement. Then we've got the ability to actually pan around the workflow. So the ability to kind of move around the workflow, navigate, that's really nice too, especially for large workflows. And then finally, the, the last enhancement I want to point out is something called document outline. In Document Outline, you can use the Visual Studio 2012 Quick Launch. If you haven't seen the Quick Launch, my gosh, it's so freaking useful. I would definitely encourage you to go use it. Um, but what I've, what I've done here is pull up the Document Outline, and you can see I get a nice tree view of my workflow as well. So I can go navigate my workflow much more easily. I can look in, uh, maybe it's in the Accept. I can double click into that one and jump down, and it'll actually show me the activity that I'm working on. So that's great, just kind of simple navigation, getting around. Now with flowchart, and, or, uh, another big enhancement where we, where we uh, made some strides was, you know, you can, you can look at this process, you can kind of understand what it's doing, right? It's starting, I get manager approval, I do a switch based on what, I, what needs to happen, and then I eventually go down here and try to get some approvals. Um, what, what we've done is also added a feature that we call annotations. And annotations allows you to add additional metadata to the workflow definition just mostly to improve the readability of the overall process. So here's the annotated version of this hiring request workflow. You can see I've got some nice text. It's docked in there, so I can, I can go reference it. Um, when I'm building out my workflow from the first time, I can leave those comments in. Um, and then when I jump down, I can still see, oh yeah, what was I implementing in this piece? Oh yeah, that's right. Uh, this is where the process starts. So that's really nice, have, having annotations. And those are very simple. You can kind of dock them in. Uh, you can dock them out. You can add annotations to, to pretty much any activity in here. And in fact, even change labels of, of things like flow switch uh, and flow decision. So those are really nice. What about, uh, let's see, what about auto connect? That's a nice enhancement. Another new enhancement with our kind of freeform designers applies both to flowchart and to state machine. The ability to kind of drop in, auto, auto connect uh, a node within your flowchart. We also even have auto insert, drop it in between, be able to drop those things and, and continue on. And those are nice new enhancements. The last one that I, that I mentioned that, uh, that got a little bit of applause, how about C-sharp expressions? All right, I'm gonna go drop, drop in a new activity. And what you'll see is when I drop this down, I got enter a C-sharp expression. I'm in a C-sharp project, I use C-sharp expressions. This particular workflow, the one that I designed before, you may have noticed, I've got VB expressions. 
That's because this workflow was designed on top of .NET 4. We didn't want to automatically convert your expressions over from VB to C Sharp in your project, break compatibility or anything like that. And so that's, that's what you end up with. Any new workflows defined, new C Sharp expressions, um, existing workflows continue to work as is. So that's great. Not a lot of really great uh, kind of new enhancements. The last one I want to show off is, is contract first authoring. So I'm going to jump over here. And what I've got is I've got a WCF service contract that I've defined. How many people have played the, the old punch out game? Punch out, yeah. How many people have played Connect Sports Boxing? How about that one? Yeah, we got a few of those. So you basically get up, you know, punch. Yeah, I'm not very good at it, but um, but uh, what I've defined here is just a simple contract. Um, you know, a punch out game. It's it's actually interesting as we talk to workflow. Uh, people who are trying to pick up workflow for the first time, a lot of them actually start by implementing a game just to get a good sense for the different pieces of the framework. So they'll go off and build the logic for a little game uh, and be able to you know, resume the game at some logical point afterwards, you know, make it more long running. It's kind of a neat, neat application of workflow just to give you a feel for the framework. So what I've done here is just uh, implemented a, a WCF service contract um, called iPunchOut. It's got join game, punch, and block. Pretty simple. Allows you to throw haymakers. That's that's pretty cool too. Um, and so what I'm going to do is, um, unfortunately, the boxing scenario. Uh, it's not really a great one for workflow in that it's not really long running. Um, but uh, but maybe I can apply this to I don't know something like presidential debates that happen over the course of three different dates. How about that? So we've got presidential debates where you know one candidate's throwing a haymaker and the other one's blocking and then the other one's jabbing and the other one's hitting the guy below the belt and that kind of stuff. That happens pretty often actually. So what I can do for contract first is I can actually go into my pro project, I can right click, I can click import service contract and in the service contract I can go filter down and basically pick out that I punch out contract. And if I click OK You'll see a nice little message that pops up and says, this operation is completed. Please build. So I'm going to go build. And when I build my, build my project now, what you see pop into my toolbox is a number of kind of helper functions here that actually map to the, the operations that are in my contract. So I can drop down the join game. And you'll see that I've actually got a nice configured receive send reply pair matches the contract that I've defined in code. Um, and actually, even if I, uh, if I add, add a little piece here to support validation, here we go. I can add this to the implemented contracts collection. What you'll see is that I actually start to get validation errors and validation warnings based on not implementing the contract completely or if I happen to have gone and made a change to the contract, say adding a new parameter, you can see that I get a validation error that says, listen, this parameter that you've added, it's not actually part of the contract. You need to go back and make sure that those things match. So that's, that's a pretty cool thing. Makes you more productive, definitely using workflow services and building those out, starting from a contract. So I've actually gone off and I finished building this particular, uh, this, this particular workflow uh, for this game. And I'm going to launch it real quick with the, uh, the WCF test client just to show you the contract pop out. So again, this is all picked up in XAML, uh, or sorry, in, in WSDL, um, and, and you can see it show up here. I've got the different operations, join game, punch, and block, and I can basically just run through a simple example like, I don't know, let's take a debate. I'll, I'll, I'll enter the debate. How about that? And I need a competitor. Uh, I'm going to call my competitor uh, Rombama. Rambama, all right, Dave versus Rambama, here we go. And then I can go, you know, and again, I can, I can play this entire, entire game. This is a workflow service that I'm communicating with. I've defined the contract for. So that's really cool. All right, let's jump back and continue on. So lots of great authoring improvements. We've also made a huge headway in, ter in terms of making sure that versioning um, is uh, addressed in terms of the framework, giving you some nice solutions for versioning. And the core pillar to the versioning story is really this thing called workflow identity. And what it is, is effectively just something attached to workflow instance that allows you to specify the name and the version number of that particular 
uh, workflow instance, or, or sorry, of that workflow definition that if, uh, effectively gets stamped onto each of the instances. And this really provides the basis on which we can build kind of a core versioning story. Because now, when we do instance storage, when, when, when we're querying for instances that are runnable, uh, when we are uh, loading instances from, from disk, um, we can do that based on the version number. And that's a real key important part. This basically provides the basis for which we can uh, implement things like you know, version mismatch. Hey, this version of this instance doesn't actually match the version of the, of the program that you're trying to execute. Or side-by-side -side versioning. I've got version one, I got version two. I want to run them at the same time. I got instances of both. Keep those running, even, even, though, I've entered, even though all new instances should start with uh, version two. And then finally, dynamic update, the ability to actually take an existing instance, maybe a version one, and upgrade it to version two based on some changes in the process. And so all of these are important enhancements that we've added as part of the .NET core runtime for, uh, for workflow. So let's take a look at what those scenarios look like. So imagine I've got a mortgage approval process. You know, pretty standard, you know, receive the application, approve it, and then issue the loan. Now imagine I've got V2 of that process, and in this V2, um, maybe you know, government, government has come in and said, hey, we need a regulation change. We need to actually you know, verify that you have the income to issue that loan. It seems like an important thing, something that a government might, might decree. Um, and so what we'll do is basically say that any instances started before a particular date, maybe before the end of this year, start with V1 of the process, all the instances that start after that should start with v2 of the process. And effectively what you've got is the ability to run these processes side by side. So if a v1 instance happens to be executing after you know, the, the change in the year, that should still run using what it started with. And that's really important. That's kind of the side by side versioning case. Let's take a look at what this looks like at the instance level. So if you look at the actual storage, Using workflow identity now, when we create an instance of the 1.0 version, we actually get a 1.0 instance stored in the instance store. Then, if, when I introduce version 2 of that pro process, I, can, I also get that stored in the instance store, and that stores version 2. So that's great. I've got these two things running side by side. Now what happens if, let's say, instead of those things running side by side, this is a breaking change in the process. I need to immediately upgrade everything that's there. Maybe, th maybe that's a scenario that's relevant for you. In that case, you can run something called dynamic update. That will basically change the version from 1.0 to 2.0 and upgrade the instance state based on the changes um, in the definitions. And those are really the scenarios that we want to go after with versioning. Um, we, we do believe there, there are a number of other scenarios around versioning. Um, we've continued to, uh, to investigate those, and we really think that, uh, that this provides the nice building blocks that are there for building out uh, a couple of these, but you know, we've got some more work to do there, definitely. All right, so finally, I don't want uh, to spend, uh, spend too much time here, but basically, hey, we've improved the performance of the overall runtime, and that's a real key important thing that we wanted to call out. Uh, we've improved it not just from a, from a runtime perspective, but also from a design time perspective. And the, the, the key improvement that we've made is really just around uh, expressions. So we've made it such that expressions, um, and expression compilation, expression validation, um, expression execution, all of that happens considerably quicker and, uh, and with better logic. And so now, now you've been able to, you know, you can keep the same workflow um, and you can take advantage of these new performance improvements because they're just part of the core, core uh, runtime. So that's really cool. Um, if you're, you're interested in, in uh, you know, what these are and if you have a particular scenario, and you can, we can kind of go through what you might see in terms, of, uh, in terms of an improvement here because we've seen definitely some significant improvements in certain scenarios in our perf lab. All right, so we've kind of talked about all of these different improvements in .NET 4.5, huge investments that we've made in, in the workflow system in .NET 4.5. And again, .NET 4.5, it's an in-place replacement, all right? You can basically just take your apps, upgrade them to .NET 4.5, and they, they will continue to run. In fact, your WF apps will, will run better. 
And, and then you can go take advantage of all these new features as well. So I mean, this, this is a no-brainer, guys. You've you got to get on this, all right? This is great stuff. So, but where do we go next? So .NET 4.5, it's great. It's come. It's actually shipped already. I don't know if you guys knew that. Um, but where do we go next? What, do we do? what else do we do with workflow? So we kind of started to think. Um, you know, let's, let's look at patterns of usage today. So let's try to understand how customers are building out workflows today, what kind of infrastructure, what kind of uh, logic they're having to build around the workflow system. Let's try to understand that a little more deeply. We started to think about that. We started to think about cloud-based services. How do I think about running workflows at scale? How do I think about running workflows uh, in, in the public cloud? How do I think about running, running workflows even in a, in a private cloud environment? Um, how do we think about that within, work, within Microsoft itself? So we got a number of, uh, of internal products or a, a number of Microsoft products, SharePoint, Dynamics CRM, Dynamics Exapta, TFS. The list goes on and on of, of Microsoft products that build in workflow functionality into their systems. And so it's, it was really key you know, for those products how are they thinking about going to the cloud? How are they thinking about workflow execution up there? And then even more generally, what about, what about SaaS ISVs? What about software as a service providers who really want to stand up some solution either in, in a shared hosting environment that they own or in, in Windows Azure in a kind of a cloud environment? How do they think about executing workflows today? What are some of the issues that they face? And so what we came away with was, was a, a few key design goals. And they really provide the pillars um, to what we, what we call Workflow Manager. So Workflow Manager, at its core, um, really wants to satisfy these design goals. First around scale and reliability. We wanted workflow execution to be able to scale out to massive limits. We wanted to make sure that you, your workflow execution could scale to the cloud. And also provide that reliability of ensuring that you can set up high availability of your workflow execution, that some of those things are provided really out of the box for you. Next, we wanted to provide multi-tenancy. And you may be scratching your head, well, why, why is this a goal? Well, imagine you as a SaaS provider. You're building a software as a service solution, and you're using workflow for its extensibility. But again, workflow is a program. You're hosting that on behalf of your customer. And so when we talk to customer, our, our, even our internal partners like SharePoint, like CRM, they were having to take workflows from their users and then host them in the cloud on their, on their behalf. And so starting to run into isolation issues, uh, you know, boundaries around fairness, um, all of these sorts of things that really affect a solution and affect workflows running in, in a cloud environment. So multi-tenancy was another area that we really wanted to focus on. The next around cloud-based messaging. So we want to embrace some of these things like HTTP. Let's take full advantage of HTTP. Let's make it first class in workflow, especially when workflows are so commonly used for coordinating work. The fact is, a lot of that work is, is web services that are hosted over HTTP. So we want to be able to call those. We want to be able to use those. And cloud-based messaging, it's, it's more than just HTTP even. Um, workflow itself has great synergies with things like brokered messaging being able to do pub-sub messaging into workflow. And so this was another area where we thought, hey, this is a, a great capability that we need to build into the, into, the prod, uh, into the product. And then finally, uh, the last two points, just around making a more turnkey solution. Uh, this was really important to us because we really felt that uh, the experience of stepping up and using workflow, having to roll your own host process, having to set up your databases for persistence, for, for tracking, um, there were a number of these things, and, and actually uh, artifact management as well. If you've got a number of different activities, different versions, different workflows, where are you going to put all these things? You've got to put them somewhere. And so we wanted to provide a more turnkey solution than that. And then finally, do all that using the Workflow 4 programming model. We wanted to take forward activities. We wanted to take forward the core runtime for executing activities and make sure that that, that, that experience uh, stayed consistent and you could leverage the same set of skills that you're used to using with Workflow today. So here's what we built. 
this is more of an architectural view. Um, and I will kind of contrast this with, this is, this is uh, a lot to think about in terms of workflow execution, in terms of it being very different than what you have in the framework today. So we'll, we'll take a little bit going through this. So first, we built a, a backend service. It's an XE. It runs workflows. It's good at it. In fact, you can scale it out. You can you know, introduce additional backend processes to scale out your workflow execution. You can set up high availability with that as well. You can you know, set up multiple nodes within a farm. That was, a, that was an important part that we wanted to include as part of our, that backend service. We also wanted this service to this, this XE to not just run you know, inst multiple instances of a single definition. We wanted it to run instances of many different definitions, which again is very different than what we've provided in the past. This is a multi-definition, multi-instance host. And as a result, multi-tenancy becomes very significant. We want to be able to execute workflows with fairness, security boundaries, isolation, all of those things as very important. The next thing is we want to focus on cloud-based messaging. So we built in some HTTP primitives. I already alluded to those. But we also did a bunch to engage with Service Bus and make it such that the, the experience for PubSub messaging into workflow was first class. So that was a huge, huge important part to us as well because we really feel like there's a ton of synergy around workflow execution, brokering, state management in terms of messages coming into your system and then the ability to scale out workflow execution that are these long-running, stateful programs. We want to make the solution more turnkey, so we introduced what was called a gateway service. So we've got now uh, a gateway that we host within IIS, and what it does is effectively provides the entry point into the system. So it basically allows you to manage workflow definitions, manage activities, manage instances, we provide effectively a first class service for you to come in and go manipulate the workflow system. And what you can see very clearly is that we have a clear separation of concerns in terms of the architecture. We've got a gateway service that's there. It's great for kind of processing the front end queries. Um, you know, what kind of instances do I have running? Um, we've got service bus, which provides that nice durability in terms of messaging into the system and the state management that we need. And then we've got a back end process that just basically reads off a service bus and angrily just, just runs and processes workflows. And so you've got these three different pieces of the architecture that are really, really key parts uh, in order to actually achieving scale and being able to take these pieces and actually scale them independently if necessary as well. And we've ex exposed all of that over HTTP, HTTPS, using, uh, using a web API, in fact, so you can go reference all of those URIs separately and it provided a nice .NET client experience for this as well. So all of this, all of this is kind of core to landing those, um, to, to kind of realizing those design goals that we had. And the last one that I didn't even mention, activity programming model. We want to make sure that that's used across the board. So we've got the, the programming model applying not just in the back end, but also in the front end in terms of the processing that it's doing um, on upload of workflow definitions, and then leveraging the core runtime in the back end. Now, this is a lot to get around, a lot to get into your head in terms of uh, workflow execution and how it's kind of, uh, how this is just such a, a different system. Um, but it's really key to be able to contrast these with the other hosts that we provide out of the box in .NET today. Because I'm sure a number of you are wondering, well, hey, how does this, how does this uh, you know, work with workflow application and workflow service host? Well, the fact is that we've got now kind of three very concrete hosts. I didn't mention Workflow Invoker here just because it's, it's pretty simplistic. Um, but we've got three different hosts for .NET workflows. We've got Workflow Application, Workflow Service Host, Workflow Manager. And all of them use that common activity programming model, that common core runtime. And that's really, really huge. But all of these things are for very different scenarios. That's what you need to understand is that is that each of these can be applied to very different cases. If you're interested in kind of explicit fine grain control of the runtime, and if you want to self-host a workflow execution experience within your own app, workflow application, that's a great solution for you. If you're interested in, uh, in, in hosting your workflows as web services, 
and being able to interact with them, get replies directly back from them. Um, if you, you know, if you want to kind of leverage message activation via IIS, Workflow Service Host is a great solution. In fact, Windows Server App Fabric is a set of tools that apply on top of this scenario in order to provide you some nice management experiences and nice end-to-end -end kind of tracking experiences with this particular hosting solution. These are great in kind of the Workflow Service Host tends to be applied in cases like systems integration, um, if you're fitting workflow into kind of service-based architectures, uh, we've seen very, very common usage of it there. And then finally, with Workflow Manager, this is your kind of de facto multi-tenant uh, scalable host for workflows. And this one really think applies well in kind of that extensible SaaS application uh, case where multi-tenancy is a real concern, where you need to go uh, execute multiple workflows in the same process and be able to achieve isolation. And then be able to leverage service bus for scale, for pub sub messaging as well. So all of these hosts together really provide us a nice, nice kind of continuum of hosting options for workflows. And some may apply to you in terms of your scenario, some may not apply to you. And you know, it's really important that you understand kind of the differences and where they can be applied in terms of scenarios. Now, Workflow Manager in particular, as I mentioned, it's, it's great for extensible SaaS applications. Well, it just so happens that that's pretty much what SharePoint is. SharePoint 2013 workflows really build on this, this Workflow Manager um, and leverage it for a number of these capabilities that I mentioned. So when we talked to the SharePoint team, uh, we, we, got, uh, we got a couple of key requirements from them. One was around supporting scale. So, hey, we're moving to the cloud. We're hosting workflows in Office 365. How are we going to scale out our workflow execution? The next was around kind of reliability. Well, I want end-to-end -end reliability. I want to make sure that a SharePoint event that fires, that it's going to get to the workflow, and it's going to, the workflow is going to be able to execute. I don't want to lose any of those. That was a, a real concern for some SharePoint customers. The next, next point that they made was really around uh, the functionality of running workflows in, in the cloud. They had to really strictly sandbox their workflow execution in, in Office 365. And so as a result, you, you kind of get an experience that's not really that extensible. Uh, it's something that's very, um, very kind of almost closed box system. And so really they came to us and said, hey, we, we want to achieve multi-tenancy here, but we want, we want to still allow kind of a, a, a rich set of functionality with SharePoint workflow. So how can we do that? Well, that's, those are kind of the core design points that we used. And then SharePoint said, hey, it's also important for us to actually ship on server as well. And so these, these uh, kind of these pieces, this architecture, Workflow Manager really is important not just in running workflows in Windows Azure uh, based on a kind of Office 365 connectivity, but also running them on-premises. And so all of these together kind of give you the SharePoint experience. So let me take you through what that experience looks like in SharePoint 2013. All right, I'm going to navigate over here. Here we go. We're in, we're in uh, Visual Studio 2012, and I'm going to just do a very basic file new project. And what you'll see is I've got this thing kind of, uh, I've installed the SharePoint tools for SharePoint 2013. And I've got, uh, I've got this thing called an app for SharePoint 2013. So if you're not familiar with SharePoint apps, don't worry. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this right now, but I will forward reference you to a number of great talks that are happening later this week on the SharePoint app model. Suffice it to say, there is an app model in SharePoint in Office uh, for uh, Office 365, and it allows you to effectively build kind of these standalone applications and the entire life cycle around building an app having a marketplace for it, being able to take those down um, and be able to leverage them in your SharePoint, SharePoint server. So I'm going to create an app for SharePoint. I'm going to create a SharePoint hosted app. Uh, and when I click finish here, it's going to basically generate me a bunch of artifacts. And so this is kind of the, generating me kind of the landing page for this app. And if I, if I clicked F5 here, basically what would happen is this would get deployed to my local SharePoint, and it'd be able to kind of debug through the experience for, uh, for this SharePoint app, kind of interact with anything that I've added to this app. Right now, all I have is kind of UI. I've just got basic CSS, uh, HTML, uh, and some jQuery in there. 
what I can do is start to add some interesting things. I can add a SharePoint list. So I, I could do add new item. I call, I call it a, a list one. And I can basically just create the list and go customize the schema of it right within Visual Studio here. So I can add things like you know, abstract, maybe candidate name. Maybe I'm creating kind of a, you know, a candidate application here. And then what I can do is then I can go add a workflow to this solution. So I can add new workflow. And what you'll see is I get some association with a SharePoint with SharePoint artifacts that are there. So I can create a list workflow. That is a workflow that's associated with a particular SharePoint list that has a bunch of items in it. So I'll associate with that list. I can create uh, a history list, and I can create a task list associated with, these work with this workflow as well. So my workflow can go off and create new tasks and an existing list um, and be able to leverage that. And what you'll see is that I'm dropped right into my Visual Studio design experience here for workflow. I can go off and build my workflow application using a lot of using all of the same primitives that I'm used to. I can use a you use a flowchart, I can use a state machine, I can do some messaging stuff around kind of sending HTTP requests, and then I can do a bunch of SharePoint stuff too. I can manipulate list items, check out, check in, create new ones, uh, update other ones. Um, I can wait for changes on a particular event or uh, on a particular item, so I can stop my workflow execution and wait for that. I can use durable timers, so I can delay in my workflow. I can delay until a particular date, even. I can create tasks, simple tasks. I can even send emails, wait for and wait for custom events. These are all all the sorts of things that you can do within a SharePoint workflow. And again, these are SharePoint specific activities. But then the rest of the activity library uh, that, that we provide out of the box around control flow, flow chart, state machine, sequential processing, all of that is there for you to go leverage. You can loop in your workflows. That's a huge win for SharePoint developers because uh, that's, uh, that's, that's a huge part of, uh, of the kind of improvements to the SharePoint workflow system. So what I'm going to do now is just switch over to uh, one, another workflow that I've kind of fully built out here. It's pretty simple. I'll take you through it. It's a flow chart. So again, I'm using, using the, uh, the capabilities of, of workflow within SharePoint here. So I'm going to first send a confirmation email to the person. This is, uh, this is a workflow driving a candidate request uh, process. So if you want to you know, request that I come out and speak at your event, to share about my wonderful presidency uh, campaign, then I can absolutely do that. You just need to request. So it'll send you a confirmation email. Then the task will be assigned to my campaign manager uh, for basically approval, because we don't just take out anything here. Come on, people. Then once the event's been approved, we create the item in the calendar, and you can nice, nicely see where Dave is at. And in fact, the last step in the process is really being able to post to things like Twitter, or Facebook. Why not? Why not be able to do that from within a SharePoint workflow? We've got HTTP primitives. You should be able to just go do that. And so when I run this workflow, here we go. We've got my landing page here for my app, Dave for President. Uh, you can see, see Dave in action. You can request an event. That'll start the process. You can look at my event calendar. You can always donate money. Uh, if you guys want to donate money, can you donate money, please? I would really enjoy it if you donate money. All right, let's continue. Uh, so seeing Dave in action, let's go request an event. So this will pop me to my, my list. And what I can do is then basically create a new, new event request. So I'm going to create a new event request in this list. I'm going to call it uh, speak at build. That makes sense. That's happening right now. Uh, my facilitator will be my good friend, Leon Wilicki. Uh The type of event, event Event in this case, uh, let's see. Uh, I'm not so good at kissing babies, and you guys probably don't want me to do that here anyway. Um, I'm going to uh, make it a speaking engagement, and basically, I can uh, I can set the start date, uh, the end date. I can say, hey, I'm speaking on the Microsoft campus here, Microsoft campus, and I can go off and create this item. There we go. We'll just add that back. Save. So this will actually start a new instance of that workflow process that we looked at. So this is a, an event in the system. Now I can go look at the workflows that are attached to that, to that uh, list item. You can see it, that this, this workflow has started. In fact, it's waiting for a facilitator to approve or plan the event. 
And so what I can do is basically just click into that, and you can see that it's got an, a task that is waiting on Leon to approve the facility. I can go edit that task, and we'll approve it. Here we go. Approved. And again, this is the SharePoint uh, list item experience in SharePoint 2013 that I'm showing here. All right, the task has been approved. Now if I refresh here, you'll see the workflow. It's creating the item in the calendar. And you can see it's actually publishing to the history as well as it goes along. There we go. All right. So if I jump back to the calendar now, once it's created that item, you can see I've got a number of things up in my calendar here. I've got my .NET developers event. Uh, I've got my booth. I'm doing some Xbox playing apparently. Uh, yeah, so, so basically the event pops up in the calendar once the workflow, here we go. Looks like that workflow has, uh, has not finished executing yet. All right, so that's the, that's the, uh, the SharePoint workflow experience really. Again, th through Visual Studio, you've got a nice kind of extensible application that you can develop. You can apply it to SharePoint list items. You can use SharePoint workflows. And all of that is great, all built on top of .NET 4.5. All right, here we go. All right, we got just a little bit more to talk about. We've got, all right, hey, let's, let's say I'm not a SharePoint developer. I'm interested in using this workflow manager thing outside of the context of SharePoint. How do I get started? Well, you can install it. In fact, it's downloadable via web platform installer. Um, or via the Download Center directly if you want to go to that link. Uh, it works great on Windows Server 2012. Works great in Windows Azure virtu virtual machines as well. You can set that up. I'll show that running in just a second, actually. Uh, then you go configure it. And what this means is basically you're going to add the node that you've just installed to a farm. And that you can basically do for to set up things like scale out, set up things like high availability, um, and basically start to kind of configure your system. Once you've got it configured, um, or even really in any order that you want, we've got a lot of documentation, we've got some samples available, we've got a forum set up ready for, you know, for people who need to ask questions about, um, about the particular execution. So by all means, take that, use it in whatever way, whatever way you need. All right, so once you've got it installed and configured, Really, the next step is you got to interact with the system. You got to get some workflows into there and stuff. And what I've created is a meta workflow. And I know your brain just exploded. This is a meta workflow of how you interact with Workflow Manager. So what we're going to show is the, the, the steps that you're going to follow in order to actually use this piece. You're going to publish activities into the system. You're going to publish a workflow based on those activities. And then you're going to go interact with particular instances of those workflows. So let's go take a look at what that might look like in our Visual Studio or in our .NET experience. Here we go. All right, jump back to demos here. So what I've got here is uh, I've got a very, very simple program. And all it's going to do is it's going to publish activities into the system. Okay. Uh, and you can kind of think about this as this is the first step to kind of getting, getting your workflow applications start to be built. You're going to publish these activities. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with this thing called Workflow Management Client. And that Workflow Management Client takes some credentials, obviously, and it takes the URI that we're going to go access. And this happens to be a Windows Azure virtual machine that I've hosted up in, uh, in, uh, in Windows Azure right now. Um, it is using Windows Server 2012. Uh, Workflow Manager runs great on it. And what we're going to do is I'm just going to very simply call this API called client.activities.publish. And all that does is it takes a XAML document for the workflow that I'm uploading, or for the activity, excuse me, and it takes the name of that activity. So I, I'm going to upload a couple of activities related to the voting process, receive vote, tally vote, and tally this thing, weird thing called an electoral vote. I still cannot get my head around what the heck an electoral vote is. But I know there's probably an activity out there for it. Um, so what, what you may have noticed is there's this little step called translate here. And what translate is is basically 
Um, again, in a multi-tenant world, we, we don't want to run code. So the, the piece of code that's in your workflow is really the expressions that are, that are in your workflow. So if we take a look at a particular activity like tally electoral vote, I don't really know the logic for this, so I'm just going to basically call out to an HTTP service that I'm going to say exists called electoralcalculator.com. And it's going to pass in the particular state and know how to calculate if you know, you've got enough electoral votes, whatever the heck that means. Um, and so what you can see is that within this workflow, I've got a couple of expressions. These are little snippets of code that I'm running within the workflow. I've got one to concatenate these two strings together. I've got another one here doing string.format. Um, and, and really, these are, like I said, these are little bits of code. And so what we do as part of this step, and again, to, uh, to achieve our multi-tenancy, um, is to basically convert those to activities that we can run and execute within our process in a safe and secure way. And again, if multi-tenancy is not something that you care about, it's not something that you need, you still want to use Workflow Manager for all of the other rich capabilities that you, that you have it for, by all means, you can kind of uh, you you can turn this turn this off. Basically, not have to worry about it. So uh, that's what I'm doing. I'm publishing those that those activities to uh, to Azure. So let me do that right now. So I'll hit F5, and we'll go publish those three activities here. So I'm going to go translate them. It's going to go publish them into uh, my, my workflow manager. Publish succeeded. All right. So now what I can do is imagine I had a separate app. So I've got another app that's my workflow design experience. And here it is. I've got a rehosted designer application here. And as you can see, what it's got is it's actually got these three activities. So it, it noticed that there are activities up here in this buildwf.cloudop.net. And it's going to go, it allows me to then go use those activities within a workflow that I go design. So if I drop down something like uh, a flowchart that I think I'm in right now, here we go, flowchart. Oh, I need to click new. Here we go. We're going to create a new workflow here. That'll drop me into the experience. Here we go. All right. Now, I'm, now you can see the workflow designer experience. And again, this is rehosted within my own WPF application here. I can then go organize those activities into whatever way that I want. So if I want to create a simple process here, again, I'm, I can use all the, all the nice little goodies like AutoConnect that, that works with, uh, with .NET 4.5. And I can basically build out my voting workflow. And then I can subsequently go publish it to, into the system. So I go publish. And this is just a, a little sample application that we've written as to uh, that you could potentially build off of if you, if you choose to um, in order to kind of create your rehosted designer experience. So I can go publish that workflow up there. Uh, new voting workflow. All right. And that'll go publish into uh, my environment. There we go. Activity and workflow successfully uploaded. So it said, now, you may have noticed it said activity and workflow uploaded. What does that mean? Well, let me jump back to the code, and you can actually see what's running under the covers of that sample app. So what's running there is actually uh, a couple of pieces of, uh, of code in particular. The first thing that we're going to do is we publish a workflow. And in order to publish a workflow, you need to publish the XAML, which is an activity. So we publish that XAML, and you can imagine just pushing the XAML into here. So I'm going to publish the elections workflow here. And then I'm going I'm to call this other API called client.workflows.publish. And what this does is it refers to an activity, the elections workflow that I uploaded here. And it provides some additional metadata related to activate, activating the workflow, as well as some other things. So this one in particular basically says, start me a new instance of this process whenever you see a message in the system with a purpose, US elections. So I've done a match all on that message to basically determine whether or not I should start an instance. And what you can see here is you start to see how we've integrated with Service Bus, how we're using brokered messaging in the system in order to activate workflows, start workflows, uh, resume workflows using those brokered messages in the system. So this is strictly for activation. Uh, you can also start a workflow manually if you so choose. You can always call client.workflows.start and actually start that workflow there, pass in some parameters. Or you can do that thing that I mentioned around sending a service bus message. You can call client.publish notification. And that will publish a notification message which, with properties and with particular content into that system. 
Now, once you've got instances created, so we've got instances created, we've got instances running, I need to be able to query. So I can call client.instances.get and be able to go query through instances, um, page through them if I so choose, maybe retrieve the first 100 instances of the elections workflow. And in fact, I can even query based on uh, what, what the status is of those instances. Is it started? Is it completed? Is it canceled? Um, all those sorts of things. Then I can query on this thing called mapped variables. And this is basically, uh, think of it as kind of promoted state from the workflow as it's executing. So if you've got a workflow instance that's, that's executing and you want to be able to query on, you know, what does that data look like right now? That's what a mapped variable is. It basically allows you to very easily promote those, those pieces of data. And so I've promoted this thing called user status. In fact, within the SharePoint example that I showed, the user status was actually that little bit of text that was showing up in the SharePoint UI that was saying, hey, this workflow is waiting for the facilitator to come and approve that. That's all customizable using this kind of user status variable and these mapped variables. Then finally, I can come in and individually manage the instances. I can call cancel, I can call terminate, um, and, and I can basically control what those instances are doing. Um, I can even provide a reason uh, for canceling that workflow, um, but this is not a problem in this particular case. So as you can see, I, I can, I, all of these interactions are happening with the workflow manager itself. Let me actually uh, TS into that box, and I'll show you specifically what, what the URI hierarchy looks like. So we've got an, actually an app uh, out of the box in our samples that allows you to kind of browse the workflow hierarchy, but I'm going to show it to you in a different light right now. I'm going to show you uh, what the URI experience is. So the fact is, all of these workflows that we just published, um, all of them are accessible via simple URIs. So I'm on the box here, so I don't have to do any sort of um, authenticating. And uh, what I created was a poll scope, and underneath of that, there was the US government scope. And so underneath of that, you can see I'm starting to query uh, and, and build out this URI hierarchy. I can go look at the activities that have been deployed in there, dollar activity. There's a new activity that's been published in there. I can look at uh, the activities that were published at this root scope. You can see I've got the tally electoral vote, the tally vote, and the receive vote activity. And I can even look at those individual activities just by name. You can see we've even got the XAML here that shows up. This is the XAML of the document that, that I uploaded, um, and as well as the metadata that goes along with it. And so as you can see, you've got this capability to kind of look at, uh, look at the entire workflow hierarchy just via resources. Um, another one that I, that I uploaded before uh, is, let's see, this one here. And I can go look at individual instances that have been started as well. So if I go uh, dollar workflows, you can see that I've got a number of different workflows here, order, tally, order. And then I can actually look at individual instances of those workflows as well. So I can look at, say, the instances workflow. I've got a number of different instances here that are running of this particular workflow. So you can already start to see all of this shows up in the URI hierarchy. All of this shows up uh, via the sample that we have that, uh, that shows off that experience. And you can imagine just building a nice management experience out of all of this. All right. So that's the workflow manager experience. And really, we're, we're just getting started with it, honestly. Um, this, this, uh, this release, this workflow manager 1.0, that's part of, the, part of the roadmap here, is really it's a very focused release, focused on satisfying the requirements that SharePoint had around their workflow usage. And so what we, what we as a workflow team are now investing in, in fact, a lot of these are in progress right now, are, are kind of future investments that we are making uh, in, in the next version of Workflow Manager. And so we want to continue to crank on experiences like the version ex experience. We want to crank on the tracking experience. We want to crank on the management experience. All of these things are kind of future investments that are coming with Workflow Manager. But really, you know, all of these, uh, all of these pieces that I've showed today, .NET 4.5, uh, Workflow, Workflow Manager 1.0, all of these are already available. You can go download them and use them, so please do. 
All right. We got those available. I'm just going to just going to wrap up now. So these these things are available. Please go use them. We've got more investments coming and just remember that workflow itself it is a work of art. It is activities, runtime, and tooling all working together uh, for your benefit. So again, vote Dave Cliff for president. All right, please. Thank you. So we, before, uh, before everyone runs off, so again, a couple of SharePoint app sessions if you're interested. And then we've got a number of, uh, number of other resources uh, for you to get in touch with us. Um, we're, we are going to be running a tap on the Workflow Manager um, v.next bits. So if you're interested in that, please, please come talk to me. We're, we're really keen to, to engage with some of you, especially you kind of early adopters. Thanks very much, guys. Have a great time at Build. <laughs>